So my name is Sandro, I'm from London and so what I'm going to talk to you about is something that it's still work in progress. Um, basically this is something that I've been trying to do for a long, long time and I wanted to, when seeing an application, imagine that you are a new guy and you join a project and there's no one there to help you. How many of you have been in this situation before? So, yeah, all the senior and smart people left, right, and you were there. And um, so, and then you, you, you don't know what the application does, what it's about, and, and then you need to fix bugs, and I have no idea where to start. And for years I've been trying to model my application, what I could actually do these things. I could, like, basically answer these questions, like, what is this application about? What does it do? If I have to add something or change something, where, how do I start? And the problem that I had with uh, was like, every time that you see the application, imagine you're on applications, uh, and you look from above, right? So you just expand a few packages or namespaces. Like, can you actually see what this is about? Uh, or uh, what it does? And that's what I wanted. I wanted like, just to expand a few packages or namespaces and know exactly what my application is about. And the problem is that every time that I've seen, and I, I've done that myself many times, was I had this mix of domain concepts and uh, architectural layers, and it was always weird. Uh, how many of you are happy with your package structure? Or no one? <laughs> right, a few. Did you define it yourself? Right. Are your colleagues happy with that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Because that's, that's the thing. I, I've, said, I've done. Uh, I've tried the package structure many times, but I was the only one happy about it. Oh, well, not even me, not even I. Well, I was not happy about it. So after some time, but anyway. So, uh, so this is one example that I'm talking about. So if you look at this, how many of you structure like that? So you have like uh, some controllers, DAOs, factories, helpers. Anyone? Right. Yeah. Some of you. But yeah, that's cool. We have controllers. Awesome, right? We have DAOs. What does it do? What is this about? I have no clue whatsoever. Right. And so another one, this oh, we need some domain there, right, to, to make some sense. And then you start trying to combine domains and layers. And then you put either the domain in front of the layers, and then you have all these cluttered and duplication and one class per folder. Or you do the other way around, you put the layers in front and domains, and then you have your domains scattered all over your, your layers. So, yeah, in this case, yeah, I know that there are books and users in the system, but yeah, what does it do? And, and then you have MVC, right? So, so wow, well, okay, let's organize that in model view controller. Wow, it's a web app, awesome! What does it do? Don't know, it's a web app, it has controllers, views, and models. It's awesome, right? So, yeah, uh, right? So, <laughs> so, so that's the problem because I've done all these things and I said like, how do I fix that? And so I could give you my solution. I could say, yeah, that's how I'm doing now. But then like, it's just five minutes of talk and you can't justify the price of bringing me here. So I need to fill up the, the space. So <laughs> I'll just put something in between until I give you my final uh, solution. But uh, what I'm going to do is, is, it's been like many years that I've been trying to, to solve that. It's not perfect, it's still a work in progress. Um, but I'm going to explain my thought process that led me to where I am today. And hopefully you can take from there and make it better. So I will start with MVC, of course. Um, so MVC started a small, stock in the, uh, a small talk in the 70s, became popular in uh, 1998. And then after that, it became a general concept. And there are many variants or variations of MVC. So for one, some of you that work with Java and are old enough like me that started in the 90s, and then you have like uh, Model 1 and Model 2 with servlets, JSPs, and stuff like that. And then you have loads of other variations like uh, MVA, MVP, MVVM, uh, PAC, and all sort of stuff. So what I've seen, I've seen many different implementations with all these uh, variants or variations of MVC. But quite often, the vast majority of them led to this. So everyone understands view, right? So we know what view is. So you have all our stuff in there that you can click and do stuff. And then you so, say, oh, model. All right, hey, I have some entities. So let's put the entities in there, right? And then you have all these classes with getters and setters or properties. Uh, in there, but say, so, wow, okay, now we need behaviors. So, wow, and uh, the, the V is done, 
the M is done. So yeah, let's put all the behavior in the controllers. And they have these fat controllers like with hundreds of lines, right? Uh, and then also because we use MVC frameworks, it's very coupled to, to our uh, MVC. So all these uh, variants of uh, variations of MVC, they are they are right, but they are also wrong, right? And the way I see it uh, is because it depends on the view, the view technology that we are using. Uh, so it depends on your delivery mechanism, like what your application is about, how you deliver that to the users or to other systems. That will change which MVC variation you're going to use. Um, so it's not that this one is better than another. And uh, a few examples, for example, a traditional web app where no, not much uh, Ajax in it, it's just like click, go to the server, come back, next page and stuff. So normally in a, in a normal web app, your controller will be on your server side. And your view is just like your JSPs or whatever you use uh, today. Uh, but then if you take a, a single page application where you lose loads of Ajax and just bits and bobs refresh, uh, then your controller moves to your view and it's very blurred with your view. Uh, and your ser uh, server normally is stateless. And then you have things like uh, desktop applications, for example. Each uh, component there, your tables, combo boxes, buttons, each one has its own MVC embedded in them. And you have consoles, like where, where is the controller in the console? How do you do that? Games, like it's crazy because like, you have loads of, uh, a, a huge combination of synchronous and asynchronous calls, things rendering all the time. So how do you do that? and then mobile, so all, all this sort of stuff. So, so this changes quite significantly. But the model should remain reasonably, with the exception of games, it's quite different, but uh, should be re remain the same. So going back to MVC, the conclusion I, that I got to is the V and the C, so the, the, the view and the controller, they belong to the deli delivery mechanism. It's how you deliver your application. Right, so that will vary which MVC uh, variation you're going to choose, so it's related to the delivery mechanism. But we should be able to decouple our model from our application. The question is, what is model anyway? Right, so model is a very overloaded and confusing term because there are many different uh, interpretations of model is, and that's why we have this confusion. We don't know where to put the logic. So are we talking about the M as a general term in MVC or domain-driven design, view model, data model? Are we talking about databases, entities? What is model? I prefer to see model as the domain model in domain-driven design. That's, that's, how, that's like what I prefer. Um, and in the domain-driven design, uh, in the domain model, it's all about the behavior. And it talks about state as well. So you have like some building, uh, building blocks that have entities, value objects. So very briefly, uh, so entities are things that you care about the identity. So your user, your book, or whatever you, 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 you have. Value objects are things that you care about what it is, but you don't care about the identity. For example, a book has a genre. Uh, for example, if it's an IT book, if it's a romance or a fiction. So you care about what it is, but you don't care uh, if the idea of the fiction is one or two. So you don't care about that, so it's a value object. Uh, then factories that you use to create complex uh, object graph uh, in your aggregate. Uh, repositories that is just a collection of data that you use to persist and, and to retrieve data. Uh, and then you have three different types of services. So very, very briefly, the application service is the one that controls the whole flow. Uh, domain service are the ones that are related to a domain concept. They have the business logic for a domain concept. And infrastructure service is everything that doesn't belong to your domain, but is still behavior, like you need to send an email out. So that would be infrastructure service. Uh, and then aggregates, that is just a, gr a group of objects. So for example, if you are, a, if you are building a, a trip uh, application, so you have a trip as the root of the aggregate, but the trip has days, and each day has location, location has photos, photos has comments. So the whole thing is an aggregate where the trip is a root. So that, that's, so we need to be able to decouple our uh, domain model. <coughs> So that means that our M in MVC becomes a DM, a domain model. And then you have the infrastructure on both sides, where if I need to parse uh, objects or convert objects to JSON or XML, you do that in the delivery mechanism infrastructure. And if I need to send some uh, emails or, or in, in concrete implementations of your databases, uh, even parsing XMLs or sending to uh, messages, listening to, to, like, listening to cues, sending methods, 
So that would be infrastructure. So cool. So if you are able to isolate our domain like that and have a clear separation, then you have a choice. If our application is small, it's a web app, for example, you can embed your domain model into the same web application and then deploy together. So there's no reason to separate. You should have a clear separation, but you can deploy it together. But you have an option, because the option means if it's a clear separation, what you can do as you grow, uh, you can have, you can extract your domain model, wrap it with architecture or, or uh, with infrastructure, and have it deployable. And then you have a choice to, to serve it the way you want, via web services, via queues. And this, if you think about it, as you wrap your domain model with infrastructure, you are very close to the hexagonal architecture, if you are familiar with that. So in the, in the infrastructure layer that is wrapping your domain model is where you would have your ports and adapters. But your domain model is always protected and you have a choice of how to provide that, to, uh, how to expose that to the external world. You can even do that. You can have like the whole thing uh, event-driven if you wanted to. Um, so, so yeah, as soon as it's decoupled, it can start together with your application, embedded, but if you have a clear separation, start having options. So that's, that's the message. So let's talk about what is in the domain model. Let's explode some of these uh, things. So that's where I tweaked some of the domain-driven design concepts and I added a few things. So everything starts with an action. So what it means is the action is all the actions that my system performs, or most importantly, is what the external world, being my web app, being another system, being a mobile client, is the, uh, they are the actions that the external world expects my system to perform. So I start from outside, what people want from my domain model, and that would be an action. So the action will talk to the domain layer, so the action is the entry point to my domain model. The action will delegate, because to complete an action, you may have multiple steps. And so the action is just controlling these steps, and, and each step is delegated to its own domain service. A domain service is an entry point to a concept. So actions is an entry point to my entire domain. A domain service is an entry point to a domain concept. For example, if you have a book and users, I will have a book service, a user service. So every time that I need something from books, I will go to the book service, so that's the domain service. So the user, I'll go to the user service. So I split the, the domain concepts and they have this entry point. And then I can have repositories. Repositories is an interesting one because like, the, I don't treat repositories as first class citizen. I, don't, I treat repositories as helper classes to my domain services. I don't expose them to other domain services. So that means that domain service two would never go across and, and fetch data from uh, repository one. Like if I need from one class, uh, I need data from repository one, I would go through the domain service. So that this way I, I minimize the coupling between the domain concepts. So it's just a helper. Um, and then I have the, the service, uh, the infrastructure services. Normally the implementation of infrastructure services and repositories will be in the infrastructure layer. It's still a bit confusing of what the, where the behavior goes. Right? And, and the way I think about it is, actions is, as I said, defines what my application does, normally triggered by an external necessity. Like we look at our use cases, and, and to go through that user journey, I will need my domain model to perform a few actions. So that's where I come. I come from outside, say, so, okay, I need actions to perform this, to execute the entire use case. Um, so that's what it's going to do, but it's a very thin layer. It will just delegate, it will just control the flow. The domain service, I'll talk about entities first, because as you've seen, I don't have entities in some of my diagrams, I probably won't have them anymore. I also don't treat entities as first class citizens. So that's one change, I don't model my domain with entities. I model with behavior. And I will talk more about that, but what goes in an entity is just the behavior that is related to the state of that entity. So if the entity has some data, is a user, I could go to the user and say, are you uh, a prime user? Or, I don't know, whatever, are you over 18 years old? This sort of stuff. So that behavior is just related to the data that the entity has. As soon as the behavior, any behavior that goes across 
multiple instances of the same entity or instances of different entities, that behavior would go to a domain service. So whatever doesn't really fit into an entity goes to a domain service. And repositories are interesting. The reason that I make the distinction of repositories and DAOs is <coughs> data access objects is a pattern to like to normally related to CRUD operations. So create a user, delete a user, stuff like that. So a repository is more like a concept of being a collection of data. So you have users, you have a users. So I don't use repositories. I try to avoid as much as possible names of patterns and layers in my classes. So the user repository would call users. If I don't have a proper name in my domain language, I'll just use the plural. But for example, depending if we have books, depending on how our domain and how our product owners talk about these things, they may call a collection of books as library. So my repository would be called library or book collection. So it wouldn't be book repository because that doesn't really make sense. Um, and then, they, then you can have whatever implementation you want. If it's an Oracle implementation for one, a MongoDB for another, so it's up to you. I think that an example probably would be good, right? Because it's, it's, yeah. So let's try to, 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 to have it like something slightly more concrete. Imagine that someone in the website added some books to the shopping cart and said, okay, I want to pay. So, so the web layer, that's your delivery mechanism, is taking the users through the journey. But the actions are performed by domain ball. So one of the actions is make a payment. So that's the entry point to my domain. So one of the first things that the make a payment can do is to delegate, uh, ask the user account service, like, is this guy valid? Is it a prime user or something like that? And then that may go to its own repository and check some stuff. Comes back. So as you see, the, the action is controlling this flow. Then it said, okay, now go to the payment gateway that is also a domain service and say, pay that. So the, the payment gateway can delegate to uh, a validator that is a normal class that can validate that um, payment data and then goes to a, an infrastructure service and say, process this card. And that's an interface. For that, I may have implementations in my infrastructure layer that is my Amex processor, my Visa processor, MasterCard processor, this sort of stuff. And then domain services can talk to each other as well. So the payment gateway could potentially speak to the order service and say, oh, now okay, it's all paid, all done. You store this order for history and stuff. And then goes back to, to the make and payment. So everything was done, send a confirmation email out by this interface. The implementation will be your SMTP email sender or whatever it is. So that's how these things uh, work. And I'm, mod I'm modeling from outside to the inside. So, an interesting thing about this is the execution flow. Think that you have an input, and this input can come from your mobile app, can come from your uh, website, can come from a different application, from a, a queue, from a web service, whatever, right? So that's your input. And then you have a first, the first clause that you handle this input. I'm, I'm putting a C as a controller, but could be a message listener or whatever. So, and then it delegates uh, to the action and domain service and repository, and, and then the code branch as well. So you can have this class doing some stuff. But the interesting thing about these is, in my view, and I couldn't prove this wrong yet, uh, but I don't like to say there is a rule, because there's always an exception to any rule. But what I noticed over the years is that the classes that are closer to my input, they represent uh, high level concepts and they don't normally do anything specific. They normally should just delegate to other classes and control the flow. And then as we get closer to the right end, closer to your output, the responsibility of the classes become more specific, become uh, more low-level concepts. So while you have a make a payment in, in, in on the, the left-hand side, here you have a create user, parts and XML. So it's very, very specific and has less delegation. And if you want into test-driven development, so this is an interesting uh, way to think about when to mock and when not to mock. External dependencies you always mock, like right? so your database you're going to always mock. Uh, but somewhere in between, the way that I think about it is, if the classes are closer to the left, their core responsibility is to delegate, is to control flow. So it's important that I test 
the interaction with other classes. So yes, I will mock and spy on the, the, the collaborators because that's the core responsibility of the class under test. As the, 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 the execution flow or the classes are closer to the end of a code branch or to my output, naturally they won't do many de um, much delegation anyway. That means they won't have many collaborators anyway, and I can use class code to to do whatever it does, and I don't need to mock because there's no delegation and collaboration because they are more specific towards the right. Uh, a few guidelines that I have. Um, So a controller, or whatever delivery mechanism, could talk to more than one action and actually control the flow from outside. I will go from the, the positive cases, then I'll tackle the, the exceptions. So an action could talk to one or more uh, domain services, or just another class or something. Domain services can talk to other classes or their own repositories. And what I don't do, I don't expose, as I said before, the repository, so repository one is not accessible by anyone besides the domain service one. So that's to reduce coupling between domain concepts. So that's just one entry point to a domain concept. I haven't found a need, well, in fact I did, uh, where one action should call the other. But when that is the case, so when it happened to us where we had, oh, this action here, so the controller is calling action one, and then, oh, we could reuse that code and call action two. And that's when you start getting into trouble. Normally when you have, at that level, a need to reuse code, you probably were missing a domain concept. So you were always able to extract a domain service and then call the same domain service from the, the, the two actions. But I wouldn't cross them like that. They, they normally shouldn't be, they should be at the same level of granularity, the actions, so you shouldn't be calling one from another. You, could, you need to bring that, the, that common code or the, the thing that you want to reuse, the behavior that you want to reuse, to inner layers, to more specific layers, that's your domain service layer. And I, as I said, I don't expose repositories, so I would never have these, with the exception if you are trying to do some sort of CQRS and splitting your, yay, <laughs> yeah, go to Alex, yes. It got there, right? Yeah. You're like waiting for that. So, uh, so normally, I wouldn't do that. But if you are trying to split your write model from your read model, uh, I would have an exception in my read model. Are you familiar with CQRS? Who, who is familiar with that? OK, a few of you. So I'll explain briefly. Uh, yeah, I still have plenty of time. So, this is a very interesting technique. How many of you use Hibernate or N Hibernate or any ORM tool? Right, many of you. So I believe that you have a lot of things in your data is like one to many, many to many, many to one, and so this sort of stuff. And then you configure what is lazy load and what is eager fetch, uh, right? So, so you have all this complexity. And, and then you have things in the middle of your domain or in the middle of your entities. You have a use case that I want, for example, I want my user with its profile and its friend and, and the user's friends, right? So I want the user with her friends and her profile. So yeah, then I will configure this one to many, one to one, and eager fetch and all this kind of stuff. But then there is another case where I want the, the same user, but now with her trips. That has photos and comments and stuff. And then you have every single entity in your domain is, is attached to each other. And then you fetch one, you fetch the entire database into memory, right? That's kind of crazy stuff. And then you never know what is eager load and eager fetch because like each use case needs a different part. And the only reason that you have all this madness is because you want to read data. You want to fetch this data and display it together in the same page. But to write, very rarely, unless that is slightly badly designed, or very specific case with data entry. Uh, but that's a different story, I won't go there because there's a solution for that as well. Um, normally when you are writing, that means you are inserting, you are deleting, you are updating. You normally update one domain concept at a time. You would never update a user at the same time that you update this, the books that that user bought and the comments. Right? So you don't do that. You're doing different steps. But when you want to read, I want the user with the books and the comments to be displayed. So what you do is, 
when you so you split your domain into it's warm, isn't it? Yeah, I want as well. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm looking at all of you. So if if you do that, if you split your write and read domains, your write domain will be extremely simple. You won't have a single entity that has any responsibility, uh, any relationship. All that kind of bollocks that we have with Hibernate and much goes away. It dies. You don't need that at all. How awesome is that? How simple that everything becomes? And then you say, yeah, but I need to query. And I need to have all this data combined. Also, you know what you do? Have an answer. Go straight to the database, do a join, and bang, you have a full object you know, display on the page. How simple is that? How awesome? Then you have an application with almost zero complexity, just because you sorted your persistence. So that's succeed your in a nutshell. And that's why I would have an exception uh, in the, the repository here, because that's a denormalized. You could go all the way. It doesn't need to be like that. So when you start and you start small, both your uh, write model and read model could go to the same database. I don't see any issue with that. If you want to scale and grow, blah, 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 you could split. Then you could have your write model. Every time that an action happens in your write model, uh, you throw an event. So a user was created, a book was added to a shopping cart, or a payment was. Right. So, what's that? I'm not going to have anything to explain anymore. Oh, right. Yeah, sorry. No. Yeah, I'm just... <laughs> well, if you want to know more about that, go to... to I'll, I'll, I need to go through loads of slides anyway, so hold your questions for a minute and I'll get to you. So, yeah, so that's the advantage. Yeah, so if you want to know more, go to our session. Cool. Uh, right, we, we talked about all of that. How do we solve it? Right, what the original question? So, we went off on a tangent here. So, right. Uh, I was distracted now. So, what, what I've done was, I have this notion of delivery mechanism and core domain. When I'm starting the application, it's too small. I don't need to create different modules and, and because it's a pain in the ass, right? As soon as you have sub-modules and you, you, you have different projects, they're deployed separately, you change one, you need to change the other, it doesn't compile, it's kind of a pain. So basically what I've done, and I start with small, I just create a new source folder. I go to Maven or whatever, SPT or whatever you're using, and I just create a new source folder. One I call core, and the other one I call web. But they are under the same project to start with, because then everything is easy, test quickly, everything else. But I create, I create this uh, separation at the very root of my project. And if I want to evolve, I can take the core and move to a new pro uh, project or module later on. So what is inside? As soon as I open, so if I have, let's take the web to start with, I don't care much about because that's the delivery mechanism and that will be different from what I, with whatever you do. But now I will have my controllers, some infrastructure, and the view. In my core, I will have three main packages. I will have my infrastructure, I'll have my model, and I will have my actions. That's, that's how I normally split. I will show you what is in there. So, the web is my delivery mechanism, and your delivery mechanism is responsible to control the user journey. It's your delivery mechanism that you take the user through a journey. Search a book, add to the shopping cart, make a payment, and the sort of stuff, right? Choose the, the, the delivery address and stuff. So the, the, the delivery mechanism does that. But each action is delegated. So that means that your controllers should be thin two, three, four lines maximum. If you have four lines, it's like, oh my god, there's something wrong, right? So controller should just control it. View, send a request, controllers already know what it is because we configured the controller to, to uh, handle certain requests. Controller said, cool, I was called by the view. Action, do your job. And then your domain model will do all that kind of good stuff. Return something, and then, okay. Now the domain model returned me this. And according to what was returned, display this view or the other view, or the same view or another view, right? That's the role of controller, nothing more. All right, controllers, three, four lines, right? Uh, infrastructure, you may have like JSONs and XML parsers and converters and stuff, so that goes to the delivery mechanism as well. It's a specific to your delivery mechanism, it's not a, a, a domain concept, unless that you have the domain module. Uh, deployed separately and it's part of the API that you provide JSON and XML, so that would go to the other side. Uh, and then in the view, you have view models, validators, whatever you have it. Uh, not very interesting, uh, but I think that here is more interesting. When you go to the core, what I do is inside model, I have my nouns, my domain concepts. 
So if I open model, that tells me what the system is about. So I open model, I have book, user, and whatever, like you, you may have, right? Comment or whatever you have. It. So that tells you straight away what your system is about. But then what it does, I go to my actions. If I expand my actions uh, folder, then I have all the actions that my system performs. And that tells me what the system does. And that's a very sm simple uh, application. Where am I? I'm going for time. Uh, that's a very simple application. That's normally how I start. Note that there's no correlation uh, from actions to the main models, uh, to, to the model, first of all. You may have add uh, search books, update user, they are directly related to your domain concept, but you may have add book to wish list or make a payment that you may not persist the payment, you may delegate to another system to do that. So actions are not uh, uh, a mapping between, so it's not like, oh, I, I look at your domain models, like your books and users, they don't have all the actions here. It is, it's more than that, it's what the external world expects from your system. Um, a slightly more complex thing, imagine that I grow my system and I introduce the concept of electronics. As soon as you do that, you have two types of products, and it's speaking to your domain uh, product owners and domain experts. So what is, how do we call books and, and, and electronics? Now we call it products. So then you go one level up, introduce that concept there as well. And in here, you can have like your actions. Do you use user stories at work? Yeah? So normal user stories in a slightly larger system will be under a theme or an epic. So you can organize your actions according to whatever theme or product module you have. So you know exactly what that thing does. And so exploding uh, my model, so what would I have? Let's take book. I ignored all the layers. I don't use layers in my package and name structures anymore, uh, namespace anymore. I don't do that. I don't think that that is needed. So I put everything on the same package. So everything that's related to book goes there. So normally we'll have a book that is delegate root, so it's the main object. Uh, book has author, so it's another entity that is part of the same aggregate. Has a genre, there's a value object, part of the aggregate. And then I have my repository, my book collection interface, book service, book validator, that's validation, which should be validator. So everything is in there, and here's the same thing. Address, users, user service. So that's how I split these things. I don't need all that kind of, I don't need to pollute my domain with service, uh, services, controllers, repositories, because they are not domain terms. Like, you don't speak to your product owner and say, oh yeah, by service, my repository, like, it doesn't make any sense, so you don't need to have it. So I open what I have, book, user, and whatever, like, you, you may have, right? Comment or whatever you have it. So that tells you straight away what your system is about. But then what it does, I go to my actions. If I expand my actions uh, folder, then I have all the actions that my system performs. And that tells me what the system does. And that's a very sm simple uh, application. Where am I? I'm going for time. Uh, that's a very simple application. That's normally how I start. Note that there's no correlation uh, from actions to the main models, uh, to, to the model, first of all. You may have add uh, search books, update user, they're directly related to your domain concept, but you may have add book to wish list or make a payment that you may not persist the payment, you may delegate to another system to do that. So actions are not uh, uh, a mapping between, so it's not like, oh, I, I look at your domain models, like your books and users, they don't have all the actions here. It, it's, it's more than that, it's what the external world expects from your system. Um, a slightly more complex thing, Imagine that I grow my system and I introduce the concept of electronics. As soon as you do that, you have two types of products and it's speaking to your domain uh, product owners and domain experts. So what is, how do we call books and, and, and electronics? Now we call it products. So then you go one level up, introduce that concept there as well. And in here, you can have like your actions. Do you use user stories at work? Yeah? So normal user stories in a slightly larger system will be under a theme or an epic. So you can organize your actions according to whatever theme or product module you have. So you know exactly what that thing does. And so exploding uh, my model, so what would I have? Let's take book. I ignored all the layers. I don't use layers in my package and name structures anymore. 
uh, namespace anymore. I don't do that. I don't think that that is needed. So I put everything on the same package. So everything that's related to book goes there. So normally we will have a book that is the aggregate root, so it's the main object. Uh, book has author, so it's another entity that is part of the same aggregate. Has a genre, there's a value object, part of the aggregate. And then I have my repository, my book collection interface, book service, book validator, that's validation, which should be validator. So everything is in there, and here's the same thing. Address, users, user service. So that's how I split these things. I don't need all that kind of, I don't need to pollute my domain with Service, uh, services, controllers, repositories, because they are not domain terms. Like, you don't speak to your product owner and say, oh yeah, by service, my repository, like, it doesn't make any sense, so you don't need to have it. Right? You just enforce that with education, pair programming, so from talking to your team and reach an agreement. Right? You don't need to enforce by package. You can't enforce that anyway. Uh, infrastructure. So here in my model, I would have like a credit card processor, an email sender, and in my infrastructure, I'll have my SMTP email sender, I'll have my Amex processor, as I said, I'll have my Gigaspace users, MongoDB, so everything that is infrastructure. The, normally the interface belongs to your domain, the implementation is infrastructure, you can switch that if you want. So that's normally what I would have, any conversion from JSON to, to XML or objects and stuff could go to infrastructure as well. So cool, I'm running out of time, so I need to run. Uh, testing, how do you test that? And then I say, well, okay, uh, yeah, we can have acceptance test, what does it mean? We can have uh, integration test, what does it mean? If I ask you what integration test means, I'll probably have like loads of different answers. And that's the problem that we had. If you Google for uh, types of tests or automated tests, you will find more than 50 types. And even when you go to the different websites and if you take integration tests, there's a completely different definition in each one of them. So, what I, what I suggest you do, go to the whiteboard with your team, draw a big box and the core modules and, and uh, responsibilities of your system and draw boundaries around them. Say, I want to test, I want, define the boundaries of your tests. So, I want this to be this, and then you give a name to it. I'll give you a few examples. So, one thing that we've done, we created a, a user journey. Uh, this, this name mean, makes sense for our team. But what was important, we draw a boundary. So, so we drew a boundary. We wanted to test just the user journey. If the page, the, the delivery mechanism would take the user through the same journey. So we can fake all our options and just test our thing uh, with everything fake. You can use BDD for that, your cucumber, all kind of good stuff. Um, and then we wanted to test uh, our behavior, each action as a whole. Yeah, we mocked the repository and test the whole thing as a whole, but we have a clear boundary of what that test was. And we also used Cucumber and BDD frameworks to, to represent that behavior. And uh, integration for us meant the boundaries of our system. So here I could have an in-memory database and just test my queries, uh, my inserts and deletes if there was everything correct. That's what we called integration tests. We had uh, unit tests, so unit tests because like I prefer to do mocking and, and London <laughs> style outside in, normally it would be for each class and having uh, mocking all the collaborators and spying on them. Uh, and then we had like a handful, like three, four end-to-end -end tests that was the whole thing deployed. This, the, the reason of this is just to make sure that the application was wired correctly. Can I just choose a random, probably the most important use case that you have? Just make sure that you go from the input to the output, but you don't need to test uh, details. You just say, is it up? Is it all wired? So that runs, uh, okay. So, of course, if you need to give a name to things, right? This is, you need to have a name, just because you need to have a name. And so, we are using, for now, like we have been spoken to the guys in, in, in my own company, and so we are calling this approach uh, interaction-driven design because it needs to be DD, right? It needs to end with DD, otherwise it's not cool. But, or it needs to be a Japanese word. Either it's DD or a Japanese word, otherwise it's not cool. So, so see, the, the, the interesting thing about this approach is that we are designing our code from outside to the inside. That's a key difference. So that we design our code with the same uh, the, the same direction of the execution flow. Uh, but one interesting aspect are the entities, as I said. I don't have almost any entities anywhere in my diagrams. Because I don't treat entities as first class citizens. It's not that I don't treat them. 
for me, I focus on the behavior. So what I'm doing, I'm making a payment. I'm cre creating a user. I'm searching for a book. So that's the action. And if, as I implement the action, these data structures will emerge, emerge to satisfy that behavior. So when you see people modeling their systems, uh, modeling their systems, say, so, okay, let's have a, a domain model session or a do domain driven design session. And then what they do, they draw entities, right? One entity, this entity relates to this entity, this has a one too many, blah, blah. And then what you end up with, you end up with a, a static representation of your data. But what does it do? Why do you need that, all these entities and that relationship? What, that, what, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? So a data model, or an entity model, is not very good. It is not enough. And I don't think that is the right way to do things. I think we should model the behavior. And then let the data structures emerge. You may not need, because when you do, you just focus on the, on the entities, you end up creating concepts that may not be used or may not even fit from the, the, the behavior that you need. Uh, another thing that is very important, a class shouldn't be modeled on its own. So you, you shouldn't do like, oh yeah, I, I think that I need this behavior or this data structure. And then you create a class and you put some public methods in there that may, someone may call it. That's wrong. That leads you, you won't gonna need it, like the Yagni, or over-engineering. A class should always be modeled from the client's perspective. Think about the class that wants to use that behavior. So coming from outside, before I, I define, this class will do all this. No, no. Figure it out that there is a class somewhere that has a need for a behavior. And then you map that behavior. So you define the APIs of a class always from the client's perspective and not from the class perspective, because you have no perspective just being the class. Right, so, so that's, that's normally how we are designing things. So going back, because I need to wrap up, so how do I answer the, yeah, I have no time whatsoever, I'm, I'm gonna stay here for another, a little bit more. So uh, how, how, do, how, do I, so how do I solve the, the other questions? So if I join a, a project now, and there's no one, or even I need to fix a bug or, or find something, I go to my model, expand that, I use nouns, so that tells me what the system does, uh, that what the system is about. If I go to my actions, I expand that, I know what my system does. And that is, will lead me through the path that I need to find whatever bug. That gives me a clear, uh, clear places for me to put the behavior. If I want to add more behavior, I know exactly where I should go. And that maps the whole thing much, much better than I could, uh, well, I find it much easier to work this way. So it's easier to talk to the business as well and model the business. So yeah, that's what I had to say. So yeah, thank you. Do we have time for questions or? Uh, yeah, so we yeah have, there's quite a few questions. We have like uh, 15 minutes of break now for the other session. So if you want to stay here for five, 10 minutes, it's okay, but. Okay, so let's do that. So if you have a question, uh, if you want to go and have a break, go and do it. Whoever has a question or wants to debate something can stay or grab me outside. Yeah? Sounds cool? Right, cool, thanks. No one's leaving. You can leave. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, who has a question? Right, yeah. But feel free to go if you want. Yeah. Uh, you said. Uh, uh, it, yes. Uh, you said that you're keeping all the code inside one project. How do you restrict the developers, for example, to not use the repositories from the controllers? We pair. We pair program, first and of all. And code review. Thanks. And code review. So basically the way we work is, first of all, we, we have constant uh, design sessions where everyone tries to understand what the design is. We pair with each other and we use Git uh, and GitHub. So we have pull requests. So a pair would be working on a branch for a few hours submit a pull request, other pairs would uh, merge that code, so they would review the code and merge, and that is a very small cycle of two hours normally. So that's how we guarantee, we don't structure. Because it doesn't matter what you try to do, like you define the packages and structures, people won't follow it. You need to have this pair programming and a constant review, otherwise you won't, never, you'll never be enforced, uh, never be able to enforce anything. That's what we do. Yeah. Yes, there is a... Yeah. 
Good. Did you consider to <coughs> the framework uh, which will wire the behaviors and actions? No, no. I, I the older I get, <laughs> I think that I'm getting very. Uh, how can I say? Uh, I don't know how to say that in English. But so more and more, I'm giving up on big frameworks. I'm using small libraries. So. I wouldn't build a framework myself because I don't need one. Uh, probably if I have a need, there's probably a much better one out there that does what I need. But I try to use very thin libraries. So for example, to provide my uh, web layer, instead of using Rails or Spring MVC or whatever people use, Play, because uh, we were doing that in Scala, by the way. And we used uh, Scalatra, that is a small port from Sinatra. To, so it's just a very, very thin DSL on top of servlets. And for the persistence, we used a norm that is a very thin library on top of JDBC. So, so I wouldn't have a framework to do any of that. That answers your question. And I just prefer the small libraries. If, <coughs> if I would have a large app and I have the different modules, and I would like to structure the code, uh, thinking of the modules, what would you structure? Would you structure the models or the actions? Both, both. So as soon as you have a need for a module, you need to move both. You, move, you need to move the concept that is, because this model, there is a need. Let's say that uh, products get very big, a lot of behavior and stuff, where user accounts and whatever else in here is not related, or payment is very different. So as these models grow out of proportion, you take the actions and the domain concepts and extract them out, and you have the same structure as okay. someone else. So I might have a, a module uh, vendors and the module products at the end, but how do I do when I have to integrate both of uh, them? You will probably take this core. So instead of having one single core, you have multiple cores, right? So each core will be named according to the module. And then the integration only happens in the delivery mechanism, because the delivery mechanism wraps your entire application. So in the actions? Uh, in the controllers, calling the if you have a dependency, then you could have a sub-module. If they are, so you need to think, is it a sub-module? Is it another module? So are they in the same level? Or? They are different, they're different modules, but they interact. Like so, vendor, vendor and product. For example, you could have something, uh, what is it? You could have something like that and expose them via web services, you could have expose them via queues, you could make them you could make them decoupled but have their own it, it varies because like this is very specific to a case. You cannot I cannot give a, a generic answer that will serve all the, the, the problems. But what I would try my best is to keep them decoupled if they are separate modules and minimize the interaction that they have. The way whatever, if it's via queues, it's via web services, or or if both modules are integrated into the same app, but it's controlled by the delivery mechanism and all. So, but it's difficult to, without having a concrete example and, and knowing more. I cannot give a single answer that to satisfy everyone. Okay. Last question. How do you use uh, TDD by the book? <laughs> I'm not quite sure what TDD by the book means. Uh, which book, right? <laughs> so, uh, what I mean is, like, I test drive all my code. So, if, if that's what you mean. And I use outside in style. I'm interested if you write a test before you write an action. Yes. I will always test drive everything from outside. As I'm designing, I have a need for an action. I will write the test first and then create the action. And mock all the collaborators and then test drive the collaborators and so on. So from outside to inside, yes, I'll test drive the Yeah, done? Okay, thank you, thank you very much.